All right, how you doing? Um, I wanted to do a short little video on um, hauling fish. We were just talking about limnology and basic water quality. Um, that's to help us understand the habitat because you know managing fish, part of managing fish is managing the habitat. But also understanding water quality is critical when you're hauling fish. And this is something else that we do in fisheries and fish management a lot is that we um, are hauling fish from point A to point B, usually from the hatchery to go stock them out. But for whatever reason you're hauling fish, you need to pay attention to the water quality because it's critical. Water quality is always critical to fish, but even more so when you're hauling them because you've got a very high density of fish. You got a lot of fish in a small volume of water. The water quality can change rapidly and so you need to pay attention to it. And also this is a very stressful time for the fish and so we need to do things to alleviate that stress and we don't want to add to that stress by adding the stress of poor water quality on top of all the other stressors, you know, because you're handling fish and they're in this loud hauler and that's very stressful. And so you have a potential for high mortality if you don't take care of your fish. So I just got a few things that I want to briefly go over. Now before we haul the fish, uh, one thing to think about is are the fish in good condition? If they're already stressed, for example, if the pond they're coming out of or the raceway they're coming out of has poor water quality, if they're in poor condition body-wise, that they're too skinny, if they have a disease or something, you probably don't want to haul them until they're in better condition. Uh, of course, you must de dechlorinate the water if you're not pulling it from a well. This seems pretty obvious, but it's something that's easy to forget. Sometimes we'll give the fish a prophylactic chemical treatment. That is, we're going to give them a dose of medicine even though they're not sick right now. But we figure that hauling is a very stressful thing and they're all in tight um, quarters and so it's very likely that they could catch a disease from being in the hauler. So sometimes we'll give them um, an antibacterial or an antifungal treatment as we're hauling them just to kind of um, you know, head that off at the pass. Another idea sometimes is to add a low level of anesthe um, anesthetic and we just want to, we don't want to knock them out completely because then they'll potentially, you could add too much and you could euthanize them, but if they're knocked out, then as the tank moves around, they're just going to get beat up against the sides, but just enough to kind of maybe dope them up a little bit, help calm them down. And so maybe they don't get as stressed out. And uh, we've talked before about adding salt to reduce the effects of stress. Uh, and this is at about five to eight parts per thousand. And I've given you um, a handout on the uh, website that talks about this. Again, the idea is, is that when a fish is stressed, they don't osmoregulate as well. One reason is um, the pores in their gills open up. And this is to allow you know, more oxygen to come in and more carbon dioxide to go out, a faster exchange of ions. Again, they're preparing for fight or flight. But the consequence is this also for a freshwater fish allows more water to rush in um, because the freshwater fish is hypertonic to its environment. And so by adding salt, we make that fish less hypertonic to its environment. And so when it gets stressed and when its gill pores open up, the water is less likely to rush in. And if you get too much water rushing in, you know, your cells could swell and burst. More, more commonly though, is that it, it causes the, um, the balances of common electrolytes, their concentrations to become too low. So they're, the electrolytes, you know, sodium, potassium, things like that, become more dilute as that water comes rushing in. So adding salt is a uh, great way to improve survival of hauled fish. If you've ever used better bait for your bait uh, that you're going fishing with, better bait's just salt for this reason. And better bait has a few other things in there, but really the salt is what does the trick. And this is regular common table salt. Doesn't have to be anything fancy. And so let's uh, do another practice calculation. We've done these before, but let's do another. So I want, uh, let's pretend that I have a 100 gallon tank that I'm hauling fish in and I want a five part per thousand concentration of salt. And 
I want to know how many kilograms of table salt must I add to get this concentration of uh, five parts per thousand. So this is a very real world problem. We've got a mix of metric and, and English units. So I'm going to pause for a second and I'd like for you to go ahead and do this calculation. Don't jump ahead yet. Do the calculation and then I'll show you my answer and you see if you agree with me. Okay, we're back. Did you get your uh, answer? Let me show you how I did it. So, of course, we start with a 100-gallon tank. And we know that we want 5 parts per thousand of salt. Parts per thousand is grams per liter of water. And so the first factor here that I have is 5 grams of salt per 1 liter of water. That's a 5 part per thousand solution. Um, okay, so now it's just a matter of converting things um, so I can end up with kilograms of salt. So um, I have 100 gallons of water. My concentration is five parts, uh, five grams per liter of water. So I need to convert my gallons to liters. And you see uh, the middle factor there, 3.79 liters is one gallon. And then I have uh, grams of salt. I asked for kilograms of salt, so I just need to convert the grams to kilograms. And so one kilogram is a thousand grams. And so then when I factor label and look at uh, cross off all units that are on the top and the bottom and multiply across the top and divide across the bottom, I end up with 1.9 kilograms of salt to get a five part per thousand solution in a 100 gallon fish hauler. So, I hope that's what you got. Um, if you didn't, come see me, let's figure this out, but this is the basic idea. Okay, so those are things that we do to kind of prepare the hauler and prepare the fish. Once we have the fish in, here are the four most important things that we want to worry about. And they're in order from most important to least important, but the least important is still kind of important, okay? These are things you gotta um, check very frequently as you're hauling fish. And it's oxygen, which is the, the most critical, ammonia, temperature, and carbon dioxide. Um, so let me talk about these, and again, you know, I put them in order from what I said are most important to least important, but they're all pretty important. So let's talk about them each individually. Of course, oxygen is very important. And when the fish are stressed, they need even more oxygen because they are respiring more heavily. And again, we don't want to add to their stress. And if we allow that oxygen to drop, that's just another stressor that we can very easily alleviate. So we're looking at about 10 parts per million is the best. And that's sort of what we're shooting for. So that's well above where it starts to stress the fish. And now you say, well, if 10's good, 20's better. So forgive me if you hear that, that's my neighbor's popping off some rounds there. I think he's empty his clip. We'll keep going. So again, some people might think, well, if 10 parts per million is great, 20's better, and 30's are awesome. No, that's not true. Is it possible to have too much oxygen? Yes, it is. Because if you get too much oxygen in there, then you have run the risk of getting gas bubble disease. And so once that water becomes super saturated, where there's oxygen, too much oxygen being dissolved for that temperature, eventually that oxygen or any gas is going to start coming out is in the form of bubbles because you can't dissolve anymore at that temperature. And if those bubbles come out in a, in a blood vessel, that can block the flow of blood and that's gas bubble disease. So you don't want to crank up your oxygen and get it too high because that can be just as bad. Now, if you have low densities, an aerator is usually okay. And by an aerator, I'm think, talking about just a pump that just pumps the water and sort of sprays it over the surface, um, exposes the water to the atmosphere. And the idea being is that oxygen will diffuse in 
into that fine mist and that'll help get the oxygen level up. And these work good for low densities, but usually at higher densities, you really need pure oxygen because the aerator is not going to add enough oxygen at high densities. And so there are many different types of oxygen regulators you might run into. We just need to talk a little bit about oxygen regulator safety because this is compressed gas and it can be um, dangerous. Now if you look at it, this is a typical regulator which you're, that you're going to run into and it's got a couple gauges on there. One gauge is the tank pressure and one gauge is the air stone pressure. So when you put this on and you open the tank, the tank pressure needle should go up and tell you how much oxygen is remaining in the tank. And then the air stone pressure should tell you how much is flowing to the air stone and flowing to your fish. And the amount of oxygen flowing to the air stone is, it, is adjusted by this diaphragm here. And these diaphragms are actually backwards. Usually, if you want to shut something off, you turn it clockwise. So if you think of a lot of things where if you want to close them, you do them clockwise and open them, you do them counterclockwise. This is the opposite. If you want to increase the flow, you turn clockwise and that puts more oxygen in. And if you want to slow down the flow, you back it off. Again, this is a very high pressure. It's something that you need to be very careful with. We always store oxygen tanks upright. Uh, we always restrain the tank so it doesn't fall. So whether it's sitting in, in the workshop against the wall or in the back of a truck or on a hauler, you need to have some kind of a chain around it to keep it from falling. And we always try and transport it upright. Um, basically, if they fall over, or uh, you can hit that valve on top. And if you hit it just right, you you know knock it off you've just created a rocket and if it's laying down horizontally and that gets knocked off again you've created a rocket so these are just good practices to be careful with your uh, oxygen tank oxygen of course is very flammable so we do not smoke anywhere near an oxygen tank this is a bad idea and something else that you probably wouldn't think of but you don't want to use oil on the threads of the regulator so when you screw that regulator onto the tank, if it's a little tight, you don't want to use oil, you want to use soap. Because the oil, the hydrocarbons can react with the oxygen and very violently. So we don't use oil on the threads of the regulator. Okay, so here's another question. Which of these air stones is better which one is and by better i mean which one's going to be more efficient and get more of your oxygen into the water the top one or the bottom one and why think about it for a second well you're probably aware that it's going to be the lower one so the air stone that makes the smaller bubbles is going to be much better because you've got a higher surface area to volume ratio for each bubble which means that the oxygen can more readily diffuse out of the bubble and into the water. If you have a large bubble, you've got a very low surface area to volume ratio, and that oxygen has to travel farther to get from the center of the bubble to the edge of the bubble where it can diffuse into the water. Another thing about large bubbles is, is they go to the surface faster. And so that large bubble is actually in the water for less time. Again, so the oxygen does not get a chance to diffuse out because the bubble goes to the surface rapidly. So this is why we want to replace air stones um, quite frequently. You want to keep an eye on them. You want something that's not clogged up that's going to give you many small bubbles. Now big time fish haulers at the hatcheries and that will use liquid oxygen. Um, for large scale operations, it's cheaper, it's easier to store, you don't have to have all those compressed gas um, cylinders laying around, you can have one big tank full of liquid oxygen. And so if you ever worked somewhere uh, that has a very large scale operation, you'll probably see liquid oxygen. 
And I've got a couple other handouts there for you to take a look at that have to do with oxygen and hauling. All right, let's talk briefly about ammonia. We've talked about it a little bit. Of course, ammonia is very toxic to fish, and this is why we want to measure it um, very frequently because it can kill our fish quickly. We talked about the relationship between ammonia, ammonium, pH, and temperature. And so if the pH is low and the temperature is low, then most of your ammonia is going to be in the non-toxic form. But if the pH or temperature changes rapidly, all that non-toxic ammonia, ammonium, can convert to toxic ammonia, but we'd rather not have any in the water to start with. And usually we have a biofilter. We have bacteria that will convert that ammonia to nitrate, which is not toxic. But rarely are the fish in the hauling tank long enough for the biofilter to kick in. You know, biofilters take weeks to establish. If you've got a brand new fish tank, it's weeks before you get enough bacteria to effectively convert your ammonia to nitrate. And when the fish are stressed, as they are when they're hauling, again, their gills open up. This is where they release a lot of ammonia. And so they're going to be releasing more ammonia. There's no biofilter there to take it up. So this is why we have to worry about this when we're hauling. There are chemicals available that can scrub ammonia. And this is not a bad idea. If you think you have an ammonia problem, you could add some chemicals that will grab that ammonia and bind it up. And so it's like a chemical biofilter. Um, another good idea is if you know you're going to be hauling the fish, just don't feed them for a couple of days. That way, when they're stressed, they don't release as much ammonia because they don't have a lot of waste in them because they haven't eaten for a couple of days. Okay, of course, temperature is another thing that we're going to pay attention to. Cooler water is always better for hauling fish. They have less stress, their metabolism is lower. Um, and of course, cold water holds more oxygen and the metabolism is lower, so there's less oxygen demand. So we always try to, to keep them cool if we can. And that's why we often don't haul fish in the middle of summer, simply because maybe our hauler is cool, but the pond or the raceway they're coming out of is not, or the lake they're going into is not, and you're just better off hauling fish with cold water. There's this concept called tempering fish, which is acclimating them to a new temperature. And so if you can't avoid it, if there is, is a big difference in temperature between the hauler and where you're stocking the fish, then you have to slowly temper them um, at least 20 minutes for each 5 degrees C difference, which means that you um, slowly bring the, say you're, you're going from a cool hauler to a warm lake, you're going to want to add some of that lake water and slowly bring up the temperature and let them sit at that temperature for a while and then bring it up a little more depending upon how big the difference is instead of taking the fish and just dumping them right into the hot water. It's sort of like making a custard. If you've ever made a custard, like if you're making ice cream, you've got this hot milk that's almost boiling and you need to add scrambled eggs to it. That's what a custard is, right? And if you just take your scrambled eggs and you dump them right into the hot milk, they're going to cook, they're going to scramble. And if you make ice cream out of that, it's disgusting. You're eating ice cream and you've got scrambled eggs in there. It's awful. So what you want to do is you want to temper your custard. So you take a little bit of that hot milk, a small volume, and you add it to the egg and you whisk it in very quickly. And because it's, it's very hot, but it's a small volume and you mix it in quickly, it spreads the heat out and it doesn't scramble the eggs. And then you take a little bit more of that hot and you put it in and you mix it very quickly. And this is how you make a custard. You slowly bring that egg up to temperature and then it's fine. Same deal with fish is that we don't want to scramble them. We don't want to just dump them into this hot water where they're going to be very stressed. Now, some would argue that, well, if you sock them into a lake, fish are smart enough, they'll just swim down to where it's cooler and they'll be fine. Except, think about most of our lakes. Where that cool water is in the hypolimnion, a lot of times there's not oxygen. And so they want to go down there where it's cool, but there's no oxygen, so they're forced to stay up where there's oxygen, but where it's warmer. So you need to think about this. Almost dropped that, but I caught it. 
And there's another problem here. What would happen if you have fish in a nice, cool, oxygenated hauler, which is what you want, and then you dump them into a very hot pond with very low oxygen and you don't temper them? What's going to happen? So you got those fish that are cool with plenty of oxygen, and now all of a sudden they're, com they're warmed up very rapidly. What do we get? We get gas bubble disease. Again, anytime you have gases dissolved in a cold or a cooler water, and then that water gets heated rapidly, it has to let some of that gas go because the warmer water can't hold as much gas. When it lets that gas go, when it comes out of solution, it forms bubbles. Well, that gas, in this example, is inside the fish. The fish gets warmed up very rapidly. Those bubbles form inside the fish. They form inside the fish's blood vessels. That's gas bubble disease. It's another reason to think about tempering your fish. Okay, last thing I wanted to talk about is carbon dioxide. Of course, you've got a lot of fish in a small area. They're stressed. They're metabolizing, <sighs> they're breathing out a lot of carbon dioxide, so it can build up. Now, can it build up enough over time to kill them? Probably not. You know, you can add enough, car you can add so much carbon dioxide that the fish will die. They probably cannot respire enough to kill them because it will anesthetize them before it kills them. And so as it anesthetizes them, then they, they slow down and so they don't breathe out as much. But your bigger problem is all that carbon dioxide will cause the pH to drop. And so that could potentially be a problem, again, if you're thinking in conjunction with ammonia. And if you have uh, a lot of ammonia and the pH drops, then it becomes non-toxic, which is great. But then when you, you know, put fresh water in, the pH comes back up. There's a lot of things going on at once, and you need to kind of sort of understand how they all relate. Also, carbon dioxide limits the effectiveness of oxygen. So 30 to 50 parts per million of carbon dioxide will cut the effective available oxygen in half. So if we're running our hauler at 10 parts per million, but we let the CO2 build up, it's like we're only running at 5 parts per million. And that's because the hemoglobin in the fish's blood is designed to carry both carbon dioxide and oxygen. And when you get a lot of carbon dioxide, the hemoglobin will will pick up more you know, carbon dioxide, which means it can't pick up oxygen. This also is related to the pH. It's the root shift and the bore shift. And, uh, and so all these things sort of you know, react together, interrelate. And you got to think about that when you're hauling your fish. Finally, we mentioned aeration when we talked about oxygen. Aeration can be effective for getting rid of unwanted gas. So we think about spraying that water over the surface in order to expose it to the atmosphere because we want oxygen to diffuse into the water, but it also will allow gases that are in the water to diffuse out. And so mechanical aeration, just spraying the water, can allow that CO2 to escape to the atmosphere, and that's a good thing. So that's an advantage of uh, aeration. And uh, so that's everything. And so that's just taking what we learned about water quality, applying it. These are just some of the more important things to think about when hauling fish. Let me know if you got any questions, and I will see you later. Bye-bye.